Hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar on the ancient wisdom and the occult side of sound. Let us explore the esoteric aspects of sound and its relationship with the spiritual life. We will follow the hints and clues given in the Secret Doctrine, H.P. Blavatsky's masterpiece of occult knowledge. After this lockdown, music is filling again the concert halls and theaters. It is all too easy to think of music as having an entertaining function. Can music be valued only in terms of how emotionally moving it can be? I really believe it might be claimed that sound has indeed a deeper and more significant aspect. Why did Albert Einstein, a groundbreaking scientist of our age, look for inspiration in Mozart's music? Hans Albert, his son, states that each time his father's work came to a dead point, a music session would work out our problems and contribute the needed inspiration. I see life in musical terms, he wrote in his personal diary. The very draft of the, the theory of rel relativity was a result of music playing, his wife once disclosed. Einstein believed that beyond all theory and observation, lay the music of the spheres, which he wrote, revealed a pre-established harmony exhibiting stunning symmetries. The effect on, of Mozart's music on the mind was much talked about in the 90s. The New York Times, in an article of August the 10th, 1999, named this factor the Mozart effect, claiming that subjects perform better on abstract or spatial levels after listening to Mozart. Years before, the Nature International Weekly Journal of Science of October the 23rd, 1993, had seriously considered the possibility that Mozart really makes one smarter. Some very attentive listeners Notice that there's some kind of music which conveys deep levels of significance, not being merely meant to move emotionally. In such music, an amazing architecture of ideas and a special outline in the structure of thought is perceived. It is perhaps why certain music is found to have a beneficent effect on the mind and emotions because it is an intuitive expression of the eternal laws of nature. In the case of certain composers like Bach, an underlying structure of a mathematical order or character can be noticed, enclosing numerical relationships unknown even today. In the face of such an amazing architecture, one wonders how those great composers sensed those higher realities and translated them, stepped them down into written music. Those great artists were able to focus their consciousness on a high level and developed ways to impress those meanings on their physical brain so that they could run true to the hidden impulse that constant and sometimes painful effort to try to understand, decode higher perceptions is a real exercise in creative imagination. The use of intuition and creative imagination has been an essential part of the work of great scientists. Einstein once told one friend, when I examine myself and my methods of thought, I come close to the conclusion that the gift of imagination has meant more to me than any talent for absorbing knowledge. He also said, all great achievements of science 
must start from intuitive knowledge. I believe in intuition and inspiration. So, what is that imagination, inspiration, or ideas which the composer receives? From an occult standpoint, it's an inflow of light which takes the form of music. The Yoga Sutras suggest that when the mind, manas, ceases to be a pool of disorganized thought forms and whirling movements allied with desire, it truly becomes a field of light in which the higher can be reflected on the lower. The incoming light is decoded, stepped down or translated into music as it passes through the inner ear and brain of an inspired artist with a sensitive mechanism of reception because light and sound are but faces of the gamut of vibrations to different ranges or octaves. Cosmic harmonies, which translate as light, are the result of, or rather are themselves, the symphonic hymn caused by the incessant movement of the life atoms of those divine beings which fill the universe, said the American theosophist G. the Peruker, a mystical description of what Aristotle called harmony of the spheres. Now, what is sound after all? Let us for a moment consider sound as phenomenon that is in its physical aspect. A body vibrates and produces a disturbance in the air, an elastic medium which initiates a movement similar to that of the water when we throw a stone into it. The atoms and molecules begin to expand and contract, thus producing what we call a sound wave. Is that sound? No, it isn't. That sound wave must reach a receptive mechanism capable of decoding it. The ear of the higher animals and man can vibrate in sympathy and transmit that information to the brain by means of a specific nerve. It is this translation of the brain, what we know as physical sound, and it does not exist as such outside the brain. When there is no receiver, a tree may fall in a forest, and no sound will be generated as we understand it, only a movement of atoms. The receiver is here the key to the matter. A sensitive mechanism is required to translate that wave into what we call sound. This wave can be highly complex and contain subwaves, lesser waves, in mathematical relationship with one another. These are called overtones or harmonics, being contained within the fundamental sound wave. This means that an only sound may contain in itself other sounds. According to H.P. Blavatsky, Atoms are called vibrations in occultism. Also sound collectively. The subjective side of sound, the sound as noumenon, as she calls it, using a Greek word, namely those forces which are the cause of the physical sound, can only be perceived by a true psychic, she claims, while the scientist is only concerned with the behavior of sound. From a physical standpoint, science declares that sound is only a wave which propagates through the air. But can the air exist without the ether, which contains and informs all its molecules? Blavatsky wondered. One can see that she was attempting to lead the focus of our minds towards the world beyond outer appearances, the world of meaning. She goes on to say, those waves which science studies are in truth produced from within, 
the atoms fill the endless space and are themselves that perpetual movement of that fathomless will whose external manifestation is what we call space. According to the ancient wisdom, the physical world has an etheric counterpart which informs and energizes it. This etheric level is in turn compenetrated by even subtler planes of being. The ether produced the sound it is read in the Hindu Puranas. Sound is the characteristic of Akasha or ether, says the Vishnu Purana. In the secret doctrine, sound as well as light and electricity are all found to be modes of motion of matter. Light, sound, and magnetism are the progeny of Fohat, the divine magnetism. I know this may sound a little, little abstract, but it is at the same time time awe-inspiring because we realize that sound has a role at the very beginning of the universe. Imagine when the hour strikes, a note is sounded by those creative powers which bring the universe into being. These creative powers or logoi are said by the secret doctrine to emerge from the boundless, eternal, absolute cause about which all speculation is impossible for the human mind. But sound is then an agent of those early emanations, early creative powers of the universe. It is that propelling force which brings together the elemental atoms and makes them aggregate and combine according to the archetypes of the cosmic mind. Yes, the universe is presented by the secret doctrine as a living and conscious being and on an incomprehensible level for us, it has a mind. This primeval sound is the word of that Gnostic gospel of John. Being speech and expression of thought, the image of a God uttering a sound which makes the universe come forth is also to be found in the Mayan Popol Vuh. In the blackness of the early dawn, the god called the heart of the sky spoke the word and the sky and the world came into being. Now, this sacred and primeval sound which makes the universe come forth can it be a dense physical wave? Evidently not. So we see that in ancient cosmologies of the East and West, sound is an agent or instrument of the creative powers that bring the universe into manifestation. This gives us a very different perspective on language. Words are sounds. Therefore, they must have power. Secret doctrine states that spoken word has a potency unknown to, unsuspected and disbelieved in by the modern sages. Because a vibration in the air is sure to awaken corresponding powers. Ancient students were never allowed to recite certain texts, lest the powers associated with them should be once more attracted. To pronounce a word is to evoke a thought and make it present. The magnetic potency of the human speech is the commencement of every manifestation in the occult world. To utter a name is not only to define a being, but to place it under and condemn it through the emission of a word to the influence of one or more occult potencies. Things are for every one of us that which the word makes them while naming them. The word or speech of every man is quite unconsciously to himself a blessing or a curse. 
extant texts of magic reveal that the ancient world was well acquainted with this power. So much food for thought can be found in the commentaries on stanza four, shloka four in the secret doctrine, particularly in the conversation between a Brahmana and his wife as found in that ancient Hindu book, the Anugita. In those ancient texts, we find so many allegories which point to the occult fact that certain truths cannot be expressed by uttered speech. Plato was very well aware of this. In his seventh letter, he made clear that certain subjects admit of no verbal expression. They, they can only be brought about in the soul through group communion, which he called Cizen in Greek. This is done as light is kindled by a leaping spark. He wrote beautiful words written more than 2,000 years ago, at a time when meditation had already been practiced for thousands of years in the valley of the Hindu river. Certain ancient languages like Sanskrit are able to embody realms of meaning not even suspected in any modern language. In India, the sounding of mantras and of the Vedas themselves was subject to strict rules, not only for a ritual to have power, but also it is believed for the whole universe to keep stable and sound. Use of sound in certain mantras is said to open the door of communication between mortals and the immortals. The Sanskrit pandits or scholars pondered on the nature of word and language from a very early age. Patanjali, the writer of the Yoga Sutras, thought that the word was the field in which the source of reality and the manifested reality meet. According to Indian tradition, the word precedes the world. Language had been created by the gods. They thought that the true teaching came from the mouth of the master and not from books. Their word for scriptures is shruti, which means in Sanskrit, what is heard. Some insightful writers have a capacity to awaken us to a new world of thought and meaning through a careful choice of words. In a demonstration of the principle, energy follows thought Certain words are infused with a deeper meaning than expected. Has it ever happened to you when reading books like The Voice of the Silence, among others, that certain words, even when their meaning is not completely understood, cause a stirring inside as if some intuitive idea were percolating into the brain? This is possibly the proof of the power of sound and the meaning it evokes. For H.P. Blavatsky, the harmony of the spheres was not a mere philosophical fancy. She looked upon sound as the effect produced by the vibration of the ether. The impulses communicated to the ether by the different planets may be likened to the tones produced by the different notes of a musical instrument. Certain kinds of music throw us into frenzy, she said. Some exalt the soul to religious aspirations in the same way as certain colors excite us while some others soothe and please. Blavatsky had been a gifted pianist herself. She had taken lessons from Moscheles, a noted pianist of the time, which suggests that she might have one, once considered earning a living as a professional pianist. Olcott suggests that. However, she thought that contemporary art was not developing along the right lines. As her article, Civilization, the Death of Art and Beauty, suggests. Impressive name, isn't it? In an almost relentless allocution, she claims that the selfishness and materialism of the modern civilization has led 
to the destruction of art and of the appreciation of the truly beautiful. Civilization, she claims, had rung the death knell of the old arts, and the last decade of the 19th century was summoning the world to the funeral of all that was grand and original in the old civilization. Of one thing we can be sure, she would certainly have agreed with Ludwig van Beethoven that music is a revelation higher than any wisdom or philosophy. Music would eventually be expected to reveal that the intelligent design which underpins the universe is organized according to mathematical principles which are in correspondence with the human mind. This is because man is a microcosm. The correspondence between the cosmos and man had already been explained by the hermetic philosophy of Hellenistic times. In the secret doctrine, in a chapter with a highly suggestive title, The Coming Forth, Blavatsky makes an extraordinary statement on the power of sound. She maintains that sound, when directed with called power, is a stupendous force, which he compares to the electricity generated by a million Niagara. Sound may be produced of such a nature, she claims, that the great pyramid of Cheops would be raised up in the air, or that a dying man would be revived and filled with vigor. She even declares to have been saved three times from death by the power of sound. This tells us much, not only about the power of sound, but also about the function assigned to sound in future ages. In conversations on occultism, she categorizes telepathy or the communication from mind to mind as a natural power which is destined to become a widespread faculty in future races. This gives us a completely different idea on the function of sound and voice, which are presently used in this race with the purpose of communication, apparently only until humanity can develop that other capacity already outlined in the Yoga Sutras of using the mind as sixth sense. Sound and word are then seen more connected with process of transferring ideas from the inner worlds into the realms of external expression. This is technically white magic, a scientific process involving the capacity to perceive within with the same intensity of focus as perceiving without. In the same chapter, right after defining sound in such an impressive manner, the author of the secret doctrine proceeds to mention a great forerunner of the research on etheric forces, the Philadelphian inventor, John Warrell Keeley. John Warrell Keeley is said by Blavatsky to have stepped into the threshold of some of the greatest secrets of the universe by means of his Keeley motor, a generator of invisible but tremendous forces. He had managed to reduce an ox to atoms, she said, by using vibration to break up the molecules of the air. Among other things, Ely had come, had come up with a definition of sound as the disturbance of atomic equilibrium, rupturing actual atomic corpuscles, and the, the substance thus liberated was a certain order of etheric flow. Had he been permitted to go further, he could have developed the power to reduce a whole army to atoms. However, such pioneer of etheric forces is now qualified by Wikipedia as a fraudulent inventor, only because he refused to disclose certain secrets and reveal certain underlying principles, which would have been a real danger to his time. A few pages ahead, H.P. Blavatsky admits that the very reason he was not permitted to go further was because Keeley had discovered a terrible force 
already known in Atlantis, she said, and by the first Aryan riches. The name she does not even dare give out it is a force which belongs to the future races of mankind. Blavatsky once gave some demonstration of, of her psychic powers, though it is well known that she would bitterly regret it later. Her, her biographical data revealed that she could make the audiences hear the sound of bells. Francesca Arundel relates how Blavatsky withdrew a series of sounds from a glass bowl of water, which she called astral bells. She refused to qualify such manifestations as miraculous. What we deem supernatural is an outcome of natural, though yet unknown, laws, almost an effect of perceiving reality directly and not through the filter of intellectual dreams, habits, or prejudices. Towering composers of the 20th century were inspired by Blavatsky's writing, among them Gustav Mahler, Jean Sibelius, and Alexander Scriabin, they all had a connection with theosophical writings one way or another. In his own way, science has also confirmed the power of sound and its relationship with ether. One particular experiment called sono sonoluminescence is brought to our amazed attention. When a sound wave is passed through a bubble in a flask of liquid, this sound wave makes the bubble do something remarkable. The vapor molecules trapped inside the bubble heat up so much that the bubble gives off an amazing burst of heat and light several thousand times a second, assuming the appearance of a star. But it was the temperature generated by this phenomenon that made it so exciting. The tantalizing possibility emerged that by bombarding a bubble with sound waves, temperatures of about 10 million degrees would be produced within its core. This way, nuclear fusion, the same reaction that powers the heart of the sun would become possible here on Earth. This outstanding experiment was first conducted in 1934 in Germany, and we are left speechless by the capacity of sound to release light and heat. Such experiments, besides confirming the infinite potential of sound to produce light and energy on this plane, it also warns us that provided certain conditions are complied with, alchemists and transmutations beyond human imagination would be possible. As a great physicist, Heisenberg has so rightly said, the first gulp from the glass of natural sciences will turn you into an atheist, but at the bottom of, of the glass, God is waiting for you. When it comes to esoteric teachings, we observe that the information given on sound from an occult viewpoint is relatively scarce, except the many suggestions and warnings as to its powers we have seen. The esoteric doctrine teaches us that each sound on the visible world awakens, evokes its corresponding sound in the invisible realms, thus, summoning some kind of occult power into action. By the way, we can suspect that Jesus was well aware of this when he did not advise his followers to gather to pray in public places. But the esoteric doctrine, doctrine hardly gives any kind of specific practice involving the occult use of sound. At this point, it is no wonder that the question inevitably arises why knowledge has limits. We constantly recognize a ring pass knot. Blavatsky hints that many depositories of occult knowledge are hidden in unreachable corners of the earth and guarded by certain beings. In practical occultism, 
Blavatsky openly states that we students of the divine wisdom are faced with conditions entirely different from those met in any other kind of scholarly pursuit. Certain rules might appear too strict, but a man who will wield a two-edged weapon must first be a master of the blunt weapon, she says, if he should not injure himself or, or what is worse, others at the first attempt. Becoming a beneficent force in nature is tied with different degrees of self-renunciation, which is a constant reminder that the whole process called spiritual path is not meant for ourselves, but for the world we live in, she warns. As one of the Mahatma letters, number 131, teaches us, outside those rules, even if we could shout for an eternity to come, for the sesame to open, it never will. But inside those rules, the access to any knowledge can be granted. Ancient wisdom tells us about the existence of certain greatly advanced beings, whom we call masters of Mahatmas, who have gone far enough on the path of unfoldment and have reached a point at which they can bear testimony of such possibility and esoterically work for the uplifting of humankind, inspiring scientific or artistic movements and producing those germ ideas and seed thoughts which can be perceived and applied by those who are sensitive enough. One may wonder how many groundbreaking discoveries in science or innovation in the arts were the result of that ability of sensitive, though sometimes unconscious thinkers, scientists and artists to tap the resources of the mental and intuitive planes, the levels where those masters and advanced disciples normally work and poor ideas. We could assume that there is a group of sensitive people who are used by those adepts as mediators or channels to advance the principles of a new age. However, the introduction of new paradigms always entails destruction of the old. A plant must disrupt the soil in order to be able to grow and unfold. Creativeness must necessarily have a disruptive quality because old patterns must be destroyed. The new paradigms introduced by those advanced minds throughout the ages are seldom accepted immediately. He wants to break up everything I teach him, said Haydn of Beethoven, his student. When Haydn listened to Beethoven's third symphony, he admitted that music had changed forever. There is one outstanding aspect of these new patterns that those great thinkers anticipate. He always presents a sort of holistic model which advocates the interconnectedness of all its parts. Science itself is showing that everything is a network. Meteorologist and mathematician Edward Lawrence poetically referred to this as the butterfly effect. The flapping of the wings of a butterfly in Brazil can determine the details of a tornado in Texas. In fact, what all of us have experienced during this pandemic may have already taught us that we are all interconnected in the same way as the musical system, where no element has significance except by its relationship with the rest of the elements. This interconnectedness underlies all esoteric teachings and is the basis of universal brotherhood, which encompasses all kingdoms of nature. But then the question arises, whether only those who are capable of isolated flights of genius can perform really creative work, those who are a rare efflorescence of human creativity like Bach, Beethoven, or Einstein, to, me, to name but a few. Maybe the time is not yet ripe for the fourth lord of creative expression, the fourth ray 
to usher in another golden age of the arts? Can we humble aspirants take part in a truly creative work? There is, it seems, a deeper meaning to the words creative imagination, which does not point exclusively to the wonderful labor of artists around the world. Einstein believed in intuition. When it comes to creative work in science, imagination is more important than knowledge, he affirmed. True imagination is not fleeing reality. What we call supernatural has to be ripped from the very bowels of reality itself. The creation of a new and more just civilization should be the concern of us all. The true creative process seems to involve the precipitation of those intuitive ideas from the buddhic or intuitional levels, and their clothing in substance so that they can finally take on physical form. It is essentially a scientific process which implies conscious work on matter. This may sound like magic Harry Potter style, but it is not, believe me. Creativity is, after all, a state of mind which entails a capacity to be magnetic and therefore change the surrounding vibration. It is the result of a state of being. At each step, the theosophical writings remind us of the possibility of transcending the concrete mind and developing the capacity to tap the resources of the intuitional plane. It is hinted that meditation is of great help in the process. We may already have understood that the teaching of wisdom is not a library of books with number pages. It contains concrete indications for life as applied for its necessity. And perhaps the measure of success is the degree of necessity. And in any case, love always underlies the search he was indeed a true yogi who said, love one another, for that entails, entails placing man as an integral part of nature. We barely glimpse the future possibilities of music, but myth can, I think, give us a hint. Orpheus was the legendary musician, poet, and prophet which was the same thing in ancient Greece. He is the archetype of the inspired musician who is able to charm both, both living and inanimate things with his music. In a way, he also stands for the mysteries of initiation. He was credited with many gifts to, to mankind, medicine, writing, divination, magic, and astrology. In the voyage of the Argonauts, he succeeded in drowning the spell of a siren song, the call of illusion, or Maya. The myth tells us that through the charm of his music, he convinced the Lord of Death, Hades, to rescue his beloved Eurydice from the underworld. He was allowed to do so on the condition that he should never look behind. We have that story in Genesis too, but he could not help it. He did, thus losing her forever. This perhaps being a symbol of the tendency of the personality to turn to the past, what lies behind on the way. He would eventually be torn to pieces by infuriated women, an analogy of spirit, the male side being divided and made multiple by mother nature the female aspect. His many gifts can give us a glimpse into the magical qualities attached to music by those anonymous creators of traditional stories. In them, music is shown to have tremendous powers, including those associated with the mysteries of initiation. Perhaps a future dispensation will reveal and confirm these amazing powers, which included assisting the healer to bring about a cure or even facilitate the process of death. Iamblichus, in his life of Pythagoras, tells us that 
within the Pythagorean school, music was used instead of medicines. Certain melodies were used as antidotes for anger or rage. They are even said to have had certain sounds to purify desires. Around the vernal equinox, a certain melody was used for healing purposes. A, play, a person playing the lyre was surrounded by a circle of experienced singers who sang specific notes. As we see already in this ancient tradition, this involves a group of trained workers. In myth, a single character like Orpheus does, does not stand for only one individual, but remains a promise for all mankind. The search for a musical system which reflects such universal order and has therefore an uplifting effect on the human soul is something we can find in Orphic and Pythagorean texts, as well as in the very writings of Plato. However, it is also noteworthy that Plato was reluctant to discuss the role of music in the telete or initiations. In the Republic, he considered music a highly dangerous discipline. He explicitly criticized certain poetry and music, which he deemed harmful. He certainly knew about the power of sound. Eastern lands have also been a fertile ground for myths and legends concerning the power of music and sound. In the sixth century BC, the Chinese Duke Lin is said to have heard the most beautiful melody played by an invisible instrument while he was in one of his travels. A music master warned him of a terrible power behind it as that melody had belonged to a destroyed kingdom. When he insisted on listening to that bewitching melody, the legend goes, the land was assaulted by plagues and winds which turned it into a desolate land for many years to come. And India has similar legends. All these wonderful stories invite us to reconsider the meaning and function of sound. In a world where silence seems to be the exception, it may be difficult to glimpse the creative function of sound and word. We are surrounded by millions of words pointlessly spoken, and if we must imagine a future awakened humanity, the real function of speech is to create, to heal, to bring about a new set of vibrations, new conditions on earth. Silence, as turns out to be the key to the problem of reception. And another thing this pandemic has taught us is that we are out of tune with nature. We human beings must simply learn not to be too noisy, eventually discovering then that a thousand voices of a universal symphony surround us. This is at least an aspect of that deeper and more significant quality of music and sound that we can undertake to disclose. So what has been called the music of the spheres assumes another proportion and meaning. We may only wonder what a wonderful capacity a group of trained disciples could develop in order to bring that world of meaning down to our world of daily living. Imagine, a group capable of issuing those sounds which create those vibrations and forms which express truths intuitively received. The resultant beauty which could be produced in the world through this use of the creative imagination could be something of which those great masterpieces of music and art are but hopes of things to come, flights of genius, by individually gifted artists who anticipated all the future possibilities in store for humankind. In the end, art remains a constant reminder of our commitment to create vibrations of beauty on this plane of daily living. 
we have felt at some point that there is some kind of knowledge or beauty which does not belong to this earth and cannot therefore be put into words. We hear a beautiful music or an extraordinary idea and a change takes place within us as if something inside resonated with what we heard. And we find it to be a true feeling even when we cannot explain it. The concept of the music of the spheres is based on the fact that sound permeates all forms. Every individual vibrates to a particular frequency. All matter sounds pulsates and has its own color. One wonders if a human being can therefore be made or trained to give forth some specific sound. Groups of people, organizations, nations, countries, they're all the result of some specific kind of ray magnetism and sound. Should we be able to hear, our own bodies would be perceived as a symphonic orchestra singing some magnificent, incomprehensible composition. The growth of a flower would be like a change in melody from day to day. If we cannot hear that universal music, it is because of the limitations of our mechanism of reception. And these words were written by Porphyry in his life of Pythagoras almost 2,000 years ago. So, our final question could then be, which is each one's real note? When Sri Ram once tried to answer this question, he said that it has to do with sounding the note of our real individuality that contributes to the group harmony, that note which represents our singular beauty. And at this point, beauty has to do with truth. For when we make a personal effort to be singular, that's the actor the personality, trying to behave singularly and impress others. When all that is gone, only the essential nature remains, which is that light, that individual ray, our distinctive note within the universal harmony. Easier said than done, yes. But the power to bring those songs of the universal spheres and that kingdom of souls into being on earth does no longer seem to lie in isolated individuals as it, as it was in the past Piscean age, but in group effort and brotherhood, a result of a sense of cooperation and spiritual community. Such is the influence of Aquarius, the coming age when many secrets about the etheric web and sound will be disclosed. The Theosophical Society was meant to become a nucleus of universal brotherhood, in itself already a fact in nature. According to the law of cycles, new ages are ushered in for mankind and therefore renewed possibilities of growth and awakening are offered by the incoming energies. This cosmic keyboard is found at the level of a cosmic mind in Theosophical words the third Logos, who makes the manifested universe a sevenfold creation, a scale of seven notes or rays. The great musician of the universe moves the keys, sounds forth another note and thus brings in another turn of the wheel. These new energies bring with them in every kingdom of nature all that is attuned to them states of matter, planes, human being, specific types of devas or of high or low order, changes in every kingdom of nature, like flowers of certain colors, fruits, vegetables of specific kinds, different animal species. Each new note sounded by the Logos signals the extinction of particular forms, some type of animal life, and leads some vegetable aspect to an end thus bringing some confusion to the scientists. The process is, of course, slow as everything in nature, as is the process of passing out. We are part of those universal cycles.
whether we recognize it or not. The time will come, we are told, when sound can be scientifically used to invoke the healing devas and truly create in the most spiritual sense we do not have the keys to that truly occult use of sound yet, though many sensitive people all around the world sense that this is possible. We can thus imagine what high type of world service a group of workers or disciples trained in meditation and the use of sound could perform. And that's what I wanted to share with you. Thank you very much.